So this is your logbook. Now, in your logbook, obviously, from your perspective, there are certain competencies. The dates that you have initialed them, you enter here. And I enter an observed date, which basically says that, yes, I've seen it. And then I basically credential it as an independent trainer sign off. Now, clearly, from our perspective, once you've been able to cover assessment and diagnosis and reporting of all the pathologies that are entailed over here at some point, and I don't want you to feel too stressed about it, because I know that not everybody is going to be able to see a case of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. For me, the credentialing for you as a, an L2 observer means that you have to diagnose four pathologies for me. They are RDS, TTN, pneumonia, and from my perspective, the, the, the fourth diagnosis mucosal aspiration. I, I think if we can get images to show that you can confidently make clinical correlation and diagnosis of these four pathologies, I'm very, very happy. I think the second aspect to it is storing your images. Now, storing your images is, is very easy. First of all, it has to be anonymized. So nothing should be able to identify the baby, but technically nobody will be able to identify a 26-weeker who's 660 grams because all over the world, there'll be millions of them who are delivered. What, what we do need, however, from you is, you know, an indication, any significant findings, and just a, a reflection. And a reflection basically from your perspective is, and I'll share my logbook with you, is it's just what, what was there about the image that you improved? Was it something related to the image quality, image pattern, or was it that you had a diagnostic kind of conundrum and we changed diagnosis a little bit based on it? But in order to store, it's quite easy. So once you've done that, my advice would be that you keep the PowerPoint presentations. And the reason you keep the PowerPoint presentations is because they keep the history, they, they keep the images stored. They're stored as clips as well. But more importantly, it's easier to embed a PowerPoint. And how do you do that? So from our perspective, if you go to the top here, I'm just trying to show you. The screen is coming into view. Is you have an insert function over here, which basically allows you to insert images. So for those of you who you know want to, I, I have no problems. You can save images as well. But really what you'd like to do is save either the videos or the loops, or the PowerPoint presentation. And for that, what I'd say is, what you've got to do is you've got to insert object. And when object comes up, uh, there are two ways to do it. You can either create from file, press browse, and basically select your PowerPoint presentation. Now, just be very careful of using the same name for your PowerPoint presentations, because what sometimes happens is, you if you, if you name a file, one and the next file you modify you save a new case you save it as one then what happens is you get all ones over here and it gets very confusing for anybody who's looking at the logbook so what you want to do is uh, like somebody in whatsapp uh, okay Lovely. So what you want to do is insert them and I would rename the files in the order in which you're doing them so one way is that you, you index them as one, two, three, four, Roman numerals or numbers. But the other way from our perspective of doing it is you can, you can, you can anonymize them by patient files. So what I've done is I have a library of all my images which are completely anonymized. They can't be identified. But you do have to clinically correlate and say, for example, if I'm, you want to use them for teaching purposes, which I'm sure you know all of you are doing so well in your imaging, you'll want to do then in that situation, it's sometimes it's easier for you to actually keep the patient credentialing in a way that can't identify the patient. And I just use an alphabet with a number. So A1, A2. So it's up to you how you want to do it. But inserting from it basically is creating from file, browse, insert. When you insert like this, it will take time. So be patient. You know, If you have three cases or five cases, it can take five minutes for it to insert. The other thing is your word file will become very heavy. Now, nothing to worry about. So, you know, from my perspective, what I'd say is that in your Dropbox account, uh, we have a lot of space. So once you save it there, 
what I'd say is when you continue and you finish and you decide that fine, I've saved and I'm not, you know, I feel confident about my logbook and stuff like that. I would advise that you PDF it. And the way to PDF it is basically to file and save as Adobe. And what it'll do is it'll PDF it into a file, which basically saves everything, including the videos and the files. It will say enable media and all you have to do is press media and that becomes your logbook for life. Uh, I think keeping it uh, very important. So I'm just giving you a simple example today. Uh, Doris got a little bit worried because she lost her file. So what I'd say is that it's always having backup servers for any logs that you're keeping. So I basically back up virtually 11 terabyte of data on three different drives. And that is very, very important. Any questions about that? I've got Naz who's raised her hand. Hi, Alok. I'm um, just going back to the initial bit. So it's got observed and supervised. So yeah. I understood that observed is that like we've seen a case or we've discussed a case that way. So you yep. observed it and yep. then supervised you've actually done it. Am I right on that? No, no. Supervised is basically observed is we've seen it, discussed it. And basically because we've discussed it, I can now initial it. Okay. And that basically means that two clinicians and normally what happens is they're two peer reviewers as part of each of the groups. So like Nadia is going through your cases, but I'm also going through the cases every Sunday. So what I will do is I will initial it over here. Now supervised might mean that somebody has achieved a level of proficiency, probably still a little bit more practice in order to be able to kind of get uh, the confidence or the ability to do it under indirect supervision. A simple example is we're going to discuss a lot of cases today and uh, that will give me a good feel of how well you're able to interpret these things. So that is a good way of looking at the learning breadth. So once, once we feel happy about that, we sign and date that and that then basically means that actually from your kind of perspective, you have two trainers who've independently signed you off as being able to clinically diagnose and manage a pneumothorax. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, thank you. It's 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 more the, the progress, you know, the risk of kind of saying that we did one DOP, we signed off a DOP, and that kind of means that we're capable of putting a, a pick line in every baby becomes a little bit tricky. So we need a little bit more kind of depth and analysis, which is what we're gonna gain in the workshops. So, and for those of you who can't attend, please do not feel worried. There will be workshops repeated. So we will be discussing cases like this again and again and again, and you'll get a lot of opportunity to be able to critique. So I've got uh, Dr. Sharif, whose hand is up. Yes, Alok. Uh, just quick, uh, say, a quick question about when we insert the object. Yeah. Um, so the way I'm doing it, like uh, I got my logbook uh, yeah. from the website. I download it as a, as a separate file on my drive. Yeah, and I try to insert object, but something has come. But now you make it clear. But how are you going to see these images if I'm uh, I'm putting it in my drive on my laptop uh, in drive C, for example? How are you going to see these images? So when you insert the object as a PowerPoint, and that's the yeah. beauty of it, the PowerPoint will have the images and the media enabled. So in old sections of Microsoft below version the current version of 365, it will ask you to enable media. So you'll have to okay. enable media, but in the new version, it automatically stores them as media. So if they're images, get stored as images. If it's media, get stores as media. And really what I'd say is a simple example, like sometimes files can get corrupted. The most common reason for them getting corrupted is you haven't waited long enough and you've tried to close the file or close your Word document. So you get a partial download. So what I like to do is once it's kind of stored and inserted, I just double click on it and open it. And basically I can see the file again and I can see the media inserted. Oh yeah, so you can, you can have access to it anyway. Yep. But all the cases I'm sharing with you at this particular point, which I'm anonymizing, they're all from my logbook. Yeah, sure. Oh yes, I see. And what is a drive? You said the uh, uh, Dropbox, sorry. So what I'd say is that you can back up on your laptop. You can back up on a USB, but let's okay. say your laptop, like my cats decided to one day have a little bit of fun with my laptop and basically destroyed it. So that kind of meant that uh, if it's not backed up, it risks you having a okay. lot of data. So what I'd say is back it up somewhere and 
most people have a OneDrive or a, a Dropbox account of some kind where they they basically keep the images and everything backed up. The, the safest way to do it is, uh, I would say that OneDrive and Dropbox are the most common, but you can use Amazon, uh, yeah. you know, which is the cheapest and actually conf confirms confirms with all all regulations in terms of security and safety. All three are are very very good. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, the lovely Doris. You're all lovely, but yeah, Doris is extra special. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Um, just to clarify, um, I'm pulling on from the question that Naz um, was asking about observed super and supervised. So these lectures that we're having, you know, we're observing images. Can we put that down? That Absolutely. They... Absolutely. So under observed. Yeah, completely, completely. And really, like we're doing a workshop today where, and that's the beauty of having these sessions recorded. So because we're recorded, I can actually go back through the sessions again, just to refresh my memory. And I do that every Sunday. You know, it's it's a real investment in time because, you know, the, the, the peer review sessions are about, they're nearly an hour. And what we're trying to do is keep them to about 30 to 45 minutes. But really, that's my my kind of aid memoir of what have we discussed and what do we feel. The difficulty that I am going to have, and that's why I'm raising the logbook today, is that some of you are maintaining it very nicely, but some of you are just putting the PowerPoints there. That means that I, if and when you do your logbook, I will have to go back if I don't remember. And can you see how that is going to make life quite uh, difficult? I mean, it's good for learning. You go back and you watch. And, you know, I've, I've trained under Dr. Suryavanshi. I mean, he's absolutely amazing. And I still go back and watch his videos again and again and again. And so, but I, I just, you know, I'm just putting it out there that I think if you want to really maximize it, I would say try to maintain the logbook and embed your images so that we can do sign off. Your first sign off is due. So for all of you, uh, I think you will be getting your, your L1 certificates by the end of this week. Okay, sorry, one more question, Alo. Yeah. And now the scans we do that are peer reviewed. So um where do, what where do we put the date on that observed? So you provide? put the, you put the date that you feel you've achieved it. On that observed. Uh, under observed. I will basically date and time it and put my signature under supervised. But okay. say for example, a simple example is pneumothorax clinical correlation. And you know what it says, it's clinical correlation and management. So really the clinical correlation, the diagnosis, we'd be able to sign off as competent to perform, but really for the procedural sufficiency, saying that you're actually using it as a diagnostic purpose, we really need to populate this under the diagnostic category to say you've done diagnostic paracentesis. So when you achieve that, whenever you achieve that, that could be an year, maybe two years from now. Hopefully I'll be alive at that time and we can have a chat. We can discuss the images and we can credential at that time. So it's not an issue. What I'd say to you is don't feel too anxious that, and I'm gonna be very frank with you. I, I do not use lung ultrasound for uh, congenital lung other than CDH because I just do not have the ability to do it. So actually from my perspective, that's something that I've never achieved, but Nadia has given such a beautiful talk on it. So now I will go forwards with it. And when I have an image like that, Actually, what I will do is I'll go and pick Nadia's brains and say, and that's what I, I, I've done with the CDH case. So really that's the way to kind of move forwards with your logbook. It's work in progress. And in my experience is, I mean, I, I still keep logbooks for all my echoes, all my lung ultrasounds, all my point of care kind of line related ultrasounds. The only thing I don't keep a logbook for is head scans because we do so many that I think we might die if we start doing it over here, at least in the, the Corniche. Thank you. Uh, Kirti, you have a question. So amongst all of these columns, we only need to fill in observed. We that's need correct. to provide. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. And really what I'd say is that uh, my experience is that you, most of you will cover everything in the six months without any problems, but a good example would be my gut feeling is you'll also see a diaphragm, but in terms of needling and putting a chest strain in, you know, it'll be interesting to see at what stage you feel confident enough to be able to do that 
with or without a chest X-ray, that's absolutely fine. We have no problem. So if you use lung ultrasound, you then did a chest X-ray, you needle observed, that's good enough for us in terms of clinical correlation actioning. If you are doing uh, a lung ultrasound for diagnostic paracentesis, and I'm going to show you lots of videos because I always do diagnostic paracentesis with a lung ultrasound if it's available. So, you know, it, what I'd say is that when you keep your, your kind of log, I'd have, there's a section underneath in the, which basically has diagnostic procedures that you can see there. So that, that's a separate column. And if you, you're using a lung ultrasound to do a diagnostic procedure like a needle thoracentesis or uh, a diagnostic paracentesis, then I would keep those images stored here. And they're very good examples of how you're using it in clinical practice. Just I look, please, but just one question to finish uh, the logbook. Yeah. Uh, when when you have the logbook, okay, we put all our cases on this logbook, and when we upload it, which website that you can see it and correct it? You can choose any website that you want. There is Microsoft OneDrive. There's Dropbox. There is Amazon. Uh, the cheapest of all three of this these are Amazon. The Amazon basically gives you a very very large amount of data sets for a very small price. Dropbox gives you two GB free. I think it does. Uh, and Google Drive gives you up to 15 GB free. My only worry about Google Drive is the security around it on European servers. In that I, ha I have seen quite a few accounts where uh, people are able to hack into it. So I, I, I just don't feel happy using Google Drive. But you can use any of these three. There are lots of other storage. You can you can have offline storage. So offline storage, if I give an example. And you can see it, uh, Dr. Alok, you can see it? Yeah, so if you share that with me, yes, I can, I can see it. But for those of you, obviously, you know, we have people who are working in countries where they can't afford this. You can store it on as a file in my Dropbox. What I would say is that once you're happy that you've finished, and you've maintained, then I would say that you you download that file and keep it with you. So you should send us an invitation for your Dropbox, yes? Yeah, my apologies. Have I not done that okay. with you? Okay, no, no. I'm so this sorry. I apologize. Okay. So I will right. do that. Thank so you, I will send it to you so that, and it's a good example. The reason I also do that is it's a good example for you to be able to peer review with each other how you can maintain, because, you know, Dr. Anna, I mean, her logbook is, it's amazing. And it's a really good example of how you anonymize and keep things in a way that is legit, legal, easily interpretable for the person who's actually sharing the images. And uh, e easily, you know, what I'd say is credentialing can be done quite easily as well. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Jean, do you want to go for it? Um, yes, I had a quick question about the file type we save. Um, my my advice, says. yeah, my advice would be that you, your PowerPoint presentations with the history and the embedded MPEGs or MP4 files are saved as a PowerPoint. If you find, and this is where I would say that less is more. And that's why I was saying it's good to present maybe one or two cases, because if you do five cases with lots of videos, your file will be very large and it will crash. And so will your Microsoft Word document. So the way I've always done it is I've always saved each, each case. And, and if you see the logbook as a single case with relevant videos of interest. And that basically means that it's the, the videos of interest that I usually save in that. Uh, up to a certain point, if you're saving one or two cases with the videos embedded as Microsoft PowerPoint, it won't be a problem. Uh, once you, your logbook becomes 100 cases, my logbook is about 168 cases at the moment, then things start becoming very bulky. So in that situation, what I'm doing now is I simply take the image that is relevant or the MPEG file that's relevant, anonymize it completely and just embed it just as an object, a single image. Does that help? Okay, so yeah, so yeah. save the PowerPoint as a PDF with the uh, movies embedded into the PowerPoint. No, no. Um, use it as, and try to embed it as a PowerPoint. If you okay. save it as a PDF, unless you're using, so I mean, try as a PDF, you can do it as a PDF as well, but when you're using it, if you're not using Adobe DC, I think you'll struggle to enable media. Have a go at both, 
and let us know mm-hmm. as well but my experience is if you're just using plain adobe i don't think it will have the facility to play media okay thank you no problems uh, dr rathor one last question from you okay i think dr rathor might not have heard me so i'm just going to stop screen sharing what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of a workshop over the next say half an hour to 40 minutes and uh, really from our perspective what what i'm basically going to talk to you today about is probably the most important aspect of lung ultrasound and that is mental modeling and it's it, it's very important that you stick to a structure that is there now i'm in trouble because i've got yeah i need to say So can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. So what what we're doing today is we're having a little bit of an interactive workshop. Uh where possible it would be nice if we can see your video. Obviously if it not reasonable uh and I know that sometimes even I am not reasonable uh but kind of while we're talking to you we nice to be able to see your face if possible. but uh, what i'm going to talk about at this particular point is a clinical radiological approach to performing lung ultrasound which we are going to use throughout our practice over the coming weeks so we a lot of you are now using lung ultrasound your diagnostic kind of correlation is the next step in that you're able to clearly identify artifact a lines b lines total sliding uh, kind of profiles a profile b profile a prime profile b prime profile c profile uh, you're also able to identify an image optimize and i would say the two aspects there that we've focused on are kind of use of frequency to improve depth especially if you're using uh, frequency in the context of say a term baby uh, where you're not getting deeper kind of sections you might want to reduce the frequency for using a higher frequency to get better depth penetration so you're familiar with that but really what we are going to do now is we're going to go through a concept of diagnostic mental modeling and what that basically says is that you should be using a clinical approach when you are trying to make a diagnosis of what you think you are seeing on lung ultrasound you should describe that after interpretation in a standardized way and a standardized way for me kind of means it really starts with tissue from the top superficial ribs the visibility of the bat sign pleura pleural sliding uh, when i talk about describing pleura so just remember the protocol that we shared with you which is kind of lung ultrasound step by step and that basically says is the pleura continuous what is the appearance like is there sliding is there an element of subpleural consolidations of any kind and then after that really what we're talking about is whether we think the pleura is thick irregular uh and broken so you're using objective terminology and kind of coming and saying oh the pleura looks abnormal abnormal has a very wide connotation now the problem is when you think about it in a more objective way you then are more likely to come to a more objective approach to making a diagnosis but really once you've kind of looked and described pleura what you're then looking at is you're looking at the partitioning and the partitioning means you are looking at each standard region i think if you're using a hockey stick you really need to do multiple rib spaces uh, and what you would be doing is longitudinal scanning as a start but where you have an element of interest like a consolidation you'd be thinking of doing transfer scans in those intercostal spaces to try and further delineate those those kind of images and at the end of it based on your kind of scan and whether it's appropriate to do the posterior regions in a supine baby you'd make a diagnostic correlation in your mind to a diagnosis you you'd kind of think of okay this is what i'm thinking and then after that what you do is you would act on that now you must be thinking dr sharma is really going through this in quite a lot of detail what's his point my point exactly is that what you don't want to do and what i see commonly and what i have done as a person in my more i would say formative years and i'm still learning is oh i look at r1 and i think r1 oh there's no mutrax there yep okay fine 
but really what I should be doing is going a step back. I should be thinking about the bat sign, pleura, pleural sliding, what the pleura looks like, underlying lung, and then basically coming to the conclusion that actually there's an A prime or an A dash profile in R1. Well, actually what is really important is that as I slide from R1 to R2 to R3, I am looking very well at trying to delineate a lung point and then I'm putting M mode. Now for visibility's sake, and we'll go through the cases today, you'll find it very interesting because uh, plural sliding is a very interesting concept. And we'll, we'll do a lot of cases today, but once you go through that process and you have done what I call a comprehensive scan, you are more able then not to miss things. But more importantly, what you might find is you think that this baby has got uh, a pneumonia and actually there's meconium at birth and this baby is about 12 hours old. And when you kind of look at the, the skin and the staining, so pneumonia and meconium aspiration are, are common differentials of each other. But if you start thinking of a mnemonic consolidation based on just looking at R1 and you haven't looked at the posterior regions, which is what me and Nadia discussed in the last, you really risk missing out. So that's a... Just an introduction, but uh, a very important aspect of the clinical approach to respiratory distress after birth is what we're going to discuss today. So what are the common, common reasons for respiratory distress after birth? So let's, let's go step by step. So uh, let's, who are we, who wants to go for it? Common causes of respiratory distress after birth. Dr. Latif. Dr. Deep might be listening in. Funny, do you want to do you want to go for the causes of respiratory distress? Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Alok. Um, so basically, if it is a term baby, usually we think of uh, TTNB. If it is a preterm respiratory distress syndrome, and then uh, if there are any features of uh, leaking PV, also we'll think of uh, congenital pneumonia. Yep. Okay. So that's good. Any others? Anybody else want to comment? Yes, we can add, uh, for example, spontaneous pneumothorax. Very good. Uh, yeah. Uh, any congenital pleural effusion or pilothorax or any yeah. lung malformation. Beautiful. So we've got we've got so a few of the differentials that come up. So you have respiratory distress, pneumonia, meconium aspiration, sepsis. Uh, there's also delayed perinatal adaptation and you know pneumothorax, and we'll talk about. TDNB and delayed perinatal adaptation, because this is very important. We'll also talk about sepsis, because a lot of babies who have underlying sepsis will be tachypneic. And really what we'll often find in them is a, a transitioning B profile. Now, the real question from our perspective is GBS pneumonia commonly often presents with a very similar kind of a B profile, which is transitioning, often with an elevated CRP without uh, any fractal or shred sign at that stage. And you have to be very, very careful of uh, really how you are clinically correlating. Now, the reason I, I keep TTNB in the middle is it's once you've excluded all these diagnoses that you'd come to a diagnosis of transient tachypneum newborn. And this is very, very important. And the reason I'm, I'm, I'm putting emphasis on this aspect of it is if you were to move to a stage where you decided, and I'm not saying that you will, and I'm still uh, a, a very big fan of using chest X-ray, but in units like Nadia's and uh, in, in China with Dr. Liu, they don't use chest X-rays at all. For them, the diagnosis of transient tachypnea is truly a diagnosis that is made by exclusion. It's made by doing comprehensive lung ultrasounds of every region. Because actually when you look at a chest X-ray, more or less you're looking at every region, but you, you might be missing out on the posterior regions, more difficult to see the retrocardiac shadows. And these are, these are regions that can be interrogated by lung ultrasound. They can give you much more information in particular consolidations. But for them, doing a comprehensive scan is a very important aspect of making these diagnoses. And they use a very similar kind of a principle of mental modeling for clinical correlation. But the less common causes, we discuss CDH, lobus sequestration, lung agenesis, then the non-respiratory causes, central causes. You know, you have babies who are tachypneic because there's something central going on. They might have congenital hydrocephalus. You know, if a baby is meningitic, they'll have high drive. Uh, the SMAs will have no drive. They'll have severe recession if they're mild. But 
that's where you'll get a normal lung ultrasound. Uh, obviously, if you intubated a baby with SMA, and a lot of these babies present floppy at birth and have significant respiratory distress for the, the, the spectrum, which is not so severe. So they end up with a tube. And it would not be unusual in units who are not doing chest X-rays for them to clinically correlate neurology, but to do a lung ultrasound and actually make a, a diagnosis which basically shows a normal lung, but a good example and how people can get confused is if your tube is down the right main bronchus and you pick up a right-sided collapse consolidation because of that, then you know the real question is if your CRP is normal and everything is normal and you pull the tube back and you repeat a lung ultrasound and it improves, then the problem here was not a pneumonia in this baby. It's not aspiration. It's mechanical collapse. And this is where your mental modeling, your clinical correlation, your description of exactly what you see now and what you see afterwards is very important. So with that in mind, what we are going to do today is before I talk about the diagnosis, is go through a few cases. So first of all, what I'd like us to do is use the standard protocol for lung ultrasound. And really what we, we, we need to do is stick to the basics. So whenever you start scanning any preterm baby, use the probe and use your highest frequency possible. I, from my perspective, I, I like using a linear probe. I can achieve a high frequency with it and I can achieve much more in terms of the anatomy. But if you have a hockey stick, just remember you're going to get only two intercostal spaces. So make sure that you're interrogating all the areas that we're seeing. R1, R2 might need multiple images with the hockey stick in order for you to get the entire anatomy. But more importantly, when you choose your preset, make sure that you, or if you're using a non-preset mode, that you've got adequate depth your focus is at the plural line and you're able to adjust frequency to be able to get the lung. Again, basics, just lung partitioning. Going forwards, for those of you who move towards L2 proficiency, you will be using the six region method. And the expectation from my perspective for any baby who's born at birth who has respiratory distress as a bare minimum is that you are doing longitudinal scanning of R1, R2, R3, R4, and R5, R6 through the posterior axillary line. If you do not want to move the baby, and this is something that Nadia touched upon, you can either tilt them slightly, and that means you won't get the entire posterior region, but what you can do, if this is the baby and the axilla, and you, if you're looking at me, is basically scanning with the probe through the posterior axillary line so that you can see the posterior part of the lung. And then if in that situation, you feel you have not made a diagnosis based on some of the cases that we described today, then really what you need to be doing is transverse interrogation of the relevant intercostal spaces. And I think if you're kind of in a situation where you, you're worried about mnemonic consolidation or pneumonia, then I would, I would suggest that you need to do comprehensive scans of all areas, because really you need to know exactly where mnemonic consolidation is. And it, you know posterior mnemonic consolidation is more common than anterior, especially if the baby is supine because of the way exudate and air actually settles. Okay, so Kirti is asked, do we wait 30 to 60 minutes before scanning posterior regions if we turn the baby? What I'd say is that actually, if I've got a baby who's supine, I will, if I want to do the posterior regions, try to get information, and I'm just going to show you my cursor, by scanning through the posterior axillary line first. If I still struggle, I will tilt the baby just a little bit like this. So not all the way on that left side to try and access the baby on that side and then tilt on the opposite side to get the posterior regions. I think if we think that it's crucial, you know, you've got something that looks really odd, you've got a translobar consolidation that will show up quite easily in the posterior axillary line simply by going through this. But for very small consolidations, really, if you see my cursor here, just below the level of the scapula, at that angle, we call that the plaps point. Really scanning in that area can, can actually diagnose posterior consolidations, mnemonic consolidations, especially for the babies who've got chronic lung disease or lungs, or a, a good example is if a baby aspirates. They usually aspirate down the right main bronchus. Now, those aspirations might be to the posterior part of the lung in supine position. So really, if you do the anterior and lateral, you get nothing you still could have a posterior aspiration because aspiration tends to go to the back of the lung. So I would say that it's really important that you know if you're thinking mnemonic consolidation or consolidation secondary to aspiration, that 
you try to do uh, the regions and handle the baby as minimally as possible, but doing the, the posterior lung fields, either through the posterior axillary line or by tilting the baby as we've tilted over here. Okay, thank you. Now, this, once you've kind of done this, I'm gonna have to stop my laser pointer. Really what you want to then do is basically think about if, if you're, you've got RDS, your lung ultrasound scores, and we as a standard will be using BRATS method. Uh, I will be discussing when I cover respiratory distress syndrome, the posterior scores that Nadia has discussed again in a little bit more detail. And there is one posterior scoring method that I would recommend that you might want to use, which you know uh, some of uh, our colleagues in Canada, in fact, Yasser's group likes to use the 12 region method and i think you know that is that is perfectly acceptable and uh, you know whether it is more effective in diagnosis i'm not sure uh, and there's certainly no evidence to say that you're better able to diagnose rds by using a 12 region method of scoring as opposed to just using the anterior and lateral kind of uh, uh, regions to score the three region method on either side so that is where I'm going to stop, but now we're going to go into a little bit of a workshop. So what we're going to do is I'm going to get uh, Dr. Zahreddin and I'm going to get Dr. Naz. Uh, so what we're going to do is, Naz, you're going to critique the L1 images, and I'm going to show you L1 images first, and then Dr. Zahreddin will critique the the R images, and we'll see. So the way we're working in this workshop is I'm giving you the history, I'm giving you the images. I want you to use the protocol that I've just described. So you're starting right from the bat sign, plura, describing the plura, then describing the region, and describing what you can see. And then at the end, what I would say is you're going to come to a mental model of what you think is wrong on that side after having seen those images. Where you don't have an image, I will, I will add in to say that it was similar in appearance to the other images. So you might have L1, L3, but I've omitted L2 because it was exactly the same as L1. So I'll, I'll let you know that. So I'm gonna give you a case. Uh, so this is a term baby born at 40 weeks. This baby was basically delivered uh, by emergency cesarean section for a little bit of fetal distress. The baby came out, uh, didn't need much in terms of resuscitation, was kind of given peep for a, a, about 20 minutes. And really the, the expectation from the, the person reviewing the baby was that they'd come back and uh, see the baby. And when they reviewed the baby at two hours of age, this baby was, was grunting quite significantly. So they admitted the baby to the neonatal unit. And by about three hours of age, I mean, this baby had parcel screen antibiotics was in 40% FiO2 on CPAP. And uh, the first gas is a pH of 7.25 with uh, a CO2 of eight kilopascals, which kind of works out to be about 60 millimeter. Lactate is normal and we started antibiotics. Do you have any other questions? Sorry, there's no history of GBS or any risk factors no, in mum no, no, scans really otherwise, good. antenatal scans are fine. Absolutely. Normal antenatal scans, no history of GBS, no history of PROM, uh, a little bit of high blood pressure, uh, but she, she kind of went into labor and, uh, you know, nobody even attended the delivery until the midwives said the baby was a little bit distressed. So had some pee, now it's grunting. Ooh. So you're seeing the L1 and L3 images. So now as you're commenting on the L1, L3 images. So um, the L1, so that'll be um, left-sided anterior upper. So yeah. you can see three um, rib spaces. Yeah. Um, and um, it's a longitudinal scan. And um, you can see the bat sign. Yeah. And you can see the pleura. You can see it sliding quite okay. nicely everywhere okay um i um 
So I think it's pretty um, regular. Um, I, probably a few um, comet tails coming up on the right side of the screen. Sure. A few of them. Sure. Um, and then you can see some A lines going down and uh, yeah, over here. And then um, some B lines coming up as well okay. over there. So when you critique this, what's wrong with the person doing the scan? Can, can he make this better? Um, the depth of it is three centimeters, but you can't see below kind of one and a half centimeter as such. So it'd be nice to Very good. get a little bit more depth. Beautiful. Well done. So, uh, so probably you want to go up to about four to five centimeters on the depth. Uh, the frequency, obviously, from our perspective, I mean, I can tell you, I'm using a frequency of 12 over here kind of means with the focus at the plural line that I've actually lost out on depth interpretation. But yeah, I agree. What about L3? So, um, so L3 would be the left sided um, upper um, lateral um, yeah. and the axillary region. Yeah. Um, so, again, um, you can see the bat sign. Um, you've got nice three four spaces in fact um, you can see the lung sliding actually uh, well yep. um, it seems a bit thicker actually on the left side um, but otherwise it's quite clean and regular yeah I why think. do you think it's thicker what what is the what is the gentleman who's doing the scan doing can he make this image better um Probably getting some nurse to calm the baby down might help, I think. Sometimes so, nurse, I think... Is, nurse is being very nice. So, really, what the problem here is probe is not perpendicular. That's a big problem. Uh, because we're in the upper part of the axilla, naturally, you know, the axillary pad of fat basically comes in there. So, getting a nurse to lift the arm, again, coming back to that concept of us making sure that we are optimizing uh, the baby for the scan. But yeah. I think I'd agree with you. So in terms of profiles, what do you think this is? And you can assume that all the other images, that's L2 to L6, were similar. So it's mainly an A profile, but there's some B lines coming in over there. It looks more like an A profile, I would say. And I probably think it's a bit of transition rather than an RDS at this stage. OK, that's great. So that's beautiful. So now I'm going to get Dr. Zaharuddin in. Uh, my apologies, sorry, Naz. Uh, we have a few more images. So do you want to just go through? So that's L3. It's a little bit better with L3, you think, this time? Yes, definitely, I think so. Um, so that was L3 as well, which we saw, isn't it? Yeah, but this time oh. Dr. Sharma got the nurse to hold the baby and repeated the scan. And it's a little bit more perpendicular. A little bit more perpendicular, um, lovely bat signs coming up, um, lots of rib spaces, um, much um, clearer, plura, lung sliding seen really well, a few comet tails coming up, but uh, mainly an A profile um, there. And the M mode? And the M mode um, shows a nice seashore appearance. Yep. So a nice seashore appearance. You've got T lines that are coming up there, which basically reflect a little bit of the heart pulse. But yeah, nice seashore appearance. And it's a really good opportunity for us to see sliding. I often, I see sliding really nicely. So when I look at the image, you can see sliding and all with, you know, a dominant A profile at this particular point. So you've got a mental model. So now let's get Dr. Zaharuddin to interpret the right lung. Dr. Zaharuddin, would you like to talk to us about the right lung? Uh, yes, thanks. Um, so R1, um, um, starting from top to bottom, really, I can see the, uh, I, I can't see the rips um, nicely um, stacked each uh, next to each other, but I can see um, a nice plural line um, with um, probably slightly uh, irregular towards the right side of the image in R1. Uh, but it's generally speaking, it's, it's nice and regular with sliding. Uh, 
there is some uh, comet uh, tail artifacts and uh, A lines as well uh, on R1. Um, the image is uh, frozen now. I'm not sure if it can yeah. Yeah. make it move again. Okay, so very nice, uh, very good. So just when you look at R1 and R2, so which of these is a transverse and which of these is a longitudinal scan? Uh, I think the uh, the uh, R1 uh, on the right is a, a longitudinal one. Uh, probably R1 uh, on the left side of the slide is a I think it's a transverse, probably. Beautiful, uh, absolutely right. So let's let's just as you described. So when you look at R one, uh, what do you think about plural sliding and the plural? Uh, uh, let me just have a look. I think it's. Uh, I'm. I'm a bit confused between the breathing movement and the uh, plural, plural sliding as well. Yeah, uh, beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And what I'd say is that this is the opportunity for us to kind of discuss the the intricacies of plural sliding, and that it, it it can be so subtle and so difficult. So just over here, do you think there's sliding here? Uh, as I said, it's, uh, the breathing movement gives you the false impression of, of sliding, but uh, maybe when I look at it um, in depth, I can't see much of a plural sliding. It's the, actually the movement of the, the breaths is, is, again, the same movement of the plural. There's no um, different movements that will give you the impression of sliding as such. So the, the plural line is moving exactly the same direction of the breaths. Okay, uh, so one thing that really helps in situations like this is if you have B lines or comet tails and you can see them move, and yeah. lines move. So if you have B lines and comet tails that are moving uh -huh. in this kind of a pattern, you 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 probably do have plural sliding. Okay, what about here? Uh, here, uh, the. the uh, there are some, perhaps there are some uh, A lines as, as uh, although they are not nicely parallel to each other's the way that I would like them to be, uh, especially the uh, A line, the first A line, it's, it looks like oblique. Um, again, there are no comet tails at all um, that I can see. Uh, not sure if there is a very vague be uh, lines, but it's mainly uh, horizontal A lines. But back to the main question, really, sliding is not as good as on the left side of the screen. Very good. So, Very good. So I think, uh, you know, the kind of, what are you thinking at the moment? Maybe with respiratory distress, keep for about 30 minutes, uh, you know, kind of two hours CPAP, still grunting. So kind of- thinking. A uh, pneumothorax will jump to mind, of course, especially yeah. with uh, uh, the clinical picture and the use of CPAP, and yeah. as well as the sliding of the uh, pleura that is missing on the right side of the screen. So when you look at the right side, which is the longitudinal image, what do we see over here? Um, th there is uh, there is a, there is sliding up to up until the uh, right side where the pointer is. That's when the B profile starts to appear, and there might be a, a, a lung point there. Uh, very nice, very nice. So beautiful. So okay. So we've clearly got uh, anything else. Uh, there is the um, what is it? The truck uh, sign, uh, truck sign, nice truck oh. sign that you can see on either sides of the pleura. pleura. So clearly, uh, worries that there's no thorax. So what do we need to do next? So next thing from our perspective is. Are M, -mode. M mode, yes, yes. Okay, so these are M modes, and uh, this is the M mode of L1, and that's the M mode of R1. So, any comments? Um, R1 obviously uh, is showing a clear distinction between the um, the two patterns of M mode that we have learned about the seashore and the barcode, while on L1 the 
uh, M mode appears to be uh, again actually. Um, if I look carefully, but it looks pretty much. I'm not sure if there is a bit of just to the right of the pointer here. Just if you move right, yeah, it's, yes, exactly. Whether and this some areas that, and this is where I'd say to you, don't worry, don't try to interrogate that too much, yeah. because depending on how coarse in the movements of the baby, really yeah. what we want to see, and this is really important, and this is where I would say to you that if if in your cases you are confused about sliding. So really what you want to do is you want to do your M mode over here and you want to do your M mode over here. And the reason you get a seashore sign is because of sliding of the visceral pleura over the parietal pleura. So mm -hmm. what is happening is because you've got sliding of the visceral and the parietal pleura, you get the shimmering appearance and all credit to Dr. Abhijit. He's taught me this terminology. So if he's here today, thank you very much. Uh, but clearly from my perspective, this shimmering gives you the classical pattern of what we call is the sand, the, the, the beach, and these are the waves. Whereas when you have air over there, the, the varietal and pistol plura are separated so they can't slide. So now a simple thing, a simple thing that I want you to do before you scan next time is I want you to take your probe. I want you to put a little gel on it and just hang it up in the air and press M mode. And when you hang it up in the air and it's not in contact with anything, it will give you the barcode. It'll give you a beautiful barcode. What it basically means is that because there's air there that is reflecting everything back, there's nothing going into the deeper tissue and you can't see sliding. There's no shimmering. But here we're at the lung point and because we're at the lung point, you see what is classically a little bit of a seashore sign transitioning to a barcode sign. So this is kind of your lung point as it comes. And really, if you move your lung point from where there is sliding to where there's no sliding, then theoretically, from your perspective, you would be able to achieve a, a transition of the seashore to the barcode sign. Well, thank so, you. So, yeah. so I can understand from this. So the, the lesson to be learned here is that if you are in doubt of lung sliding, then your next step is obviously M mode. M mode. And just a recommendation from my side. Oh, you can go. Sorry, was yeah. that a question? Sorry. So I was just saying that my, my standard practice would be that when I'm doing my first lung ultrasound on every baby and I'm doing the, the transverse and the longitudinal scanning, I, I, I do longitudinal where I'm worried about a pneumothorax, and then if I find areas where there's a lung point, I'll then interrogate that area transversely as well, moving from the center of the chest out. Some people like to move from outside to in, but it is very important that if you're confused whether they're sliding or not in a small area, that you, you put the M mode on and interrogate that area. And I would do M modes for all those areas as my first scan. So what is what is your diagnosis? So. Uh, Let's let uh, the Dr. Naz come in. Dr. Naz, do you agree with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, your colleague's findings? That is Dr. Zardin's findings? Yes. Okay. So what do you think you have here? Assuming uh, that every other region. So let's see if I had the R2 images. Probably didn't actually, but... Need to take the laser pointer off. So this is just again playing out. So you can see as I play them out the transition of the lung point there. And here you've got a classical seashore sign. And it's more visible on this image, actually, better visible. So you can see the transition completely where you transition into an area that is a barcode sign, seashore sign. And then basically what I'm, I, I've got is complete barcode. I've gone into the area. And can you see there's absolutely no plural sliding there? So this is, this is seashore sign and you're transitioning and this is all barcode here. So now you've moved from R1 to R3. So what kind of a pneumothorax do you think this is? This is probably a... Fairly big pneumothorax um, over here. Okay. So if I were to say to your baby is in 30 
35%. Pulses are palpable. Your CO2 is about 55. pH is 7.26. He's grunting. So this is where I'd say to you, you're right. There is quite a significant collection over here. But actually, from my perspective, the real question that I'm asking is, are we in a situation where we need to do anything about this clinically? So what would your clinical approach be now but in your respective areas? So if I ask Dr. Zahedin first, what if you were doing lung ultrasound where you currently work, what do you think you'd do if you found this? Um, to be very, very honest, I'm going to do a chest X-ray. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. That's exactly what I'd be doing over here as well. Uh, Naz, what, what would you be doing? I'd be doing a chest X-ray, but I'll also be looking clinically what's happening to the baby as well. Yeah. Yeah. And really what I'd say to you is that actually the top half of R1 is not, you know, it's normal. You have sliding there. It's, it's, there's, a, there's an area between R1 and R3. So, you know, in a baby that's clinically so stable, he's grunting, his FiO2 is only 30, saturating beautifully, no pre and post ductal sats difference. Uh, take my word for it clinically when we did the x-ray, what we had was just a very small anterior pneumothorax. And we conservatively manage this baby. So, any questions about this? So, first, Naz and Dr. Zaradin, any questions? So, when we are looking at a pneumothorax, we um, all, uh, when we do the chest X-ray and we look clinically, as you said, clinically, this baby is relatively stable. Gases are pretty okay, um, saturating well. You know, um, you'd leave this baby on CPAP and see how things go and progress. No, I'd, I'd, if I could, I'd put this baby Take on off the floor. Take him off, yeah. off the floor. Vapor. That would be my approach, yeah. but I mean, or, uh, yeah. And, and I guess some people might just put in a needle in and see. Yeah. My question is that um, you, in the sense that we, you know, the thing, does the ultrasound show kind of like shift in mediastinum and other things, like if it's, you know, those, would, would you be able to see that? So very good. No, you won't. But the question that I would then ask you for the purists who are just doing lung ultrasound is clinically, if the baby is like that and you aim to either needle or you aim to manage conservatively, and I think the majority of people would manage this case conservatively is my impression until such time as the baby deteriorates. And what they would do is they would do trend analysis. And a trend analysis is you look at the baby over the next few hours to see whether it's deteriorating or getting better. And if it's deteriorating, they'd repeat a lung ultrasound. And if the pneumothorax was larger, then clinically they'd needle. The mediastinal shift in itself would not alter management significantly unless you find that there are other things clinically. I think clinically, if you're in a situation where this baby has weak pulses and or you know, uh, has severe respiratory distress, then you're making a diagnosis of a clinical kind of tension pneumothorax. And in that situation, the argument would be, well, most of those babies you'd needle even before getting a chest X-ray. So that, that is the argument that you'll get from the people who don't do an X-ray. I think my argument is that actually, why not use both if you have them? And the reason for that is once you do a chest X-ray, we clearly have in our units where we work people who won't be using lung ultrasound. We need to be able to quantify this for them. And more importantly, I think uh, trend analysis for them, because they will not be able to do lung ultrasound later on, might mean that they will be repeating an X-ray. So I think that's where, that's where you know, there's slight differences in practice, which I would say are within an acceptable norm, where for a unit that doesn't do chest X-rays, that's acceptable. And for a unit that is starting to practice lung ultrasound, there's, there's an acceptability to it. So uh, Mayank has a question. Would you call it a large pneumothorax? No, I wouldn't. Because actually the, the, the upper half of R1, when I scanned it, actually has got lung sliding all the way. So really I've got air, probably R1, R2, uh, and a bit of R3 at this particular point. So there's an anterior kind of collection of air because this baby is supine. But if I look at the symptomatology as well, then uh, uh, theoretically from my perspective, uh, I would say that, it doesn't fit with that. I'll show you the X-ray on the next, uh, the next class. I'm very happy to share it with you, which shows a very small anterior collection. Uh, nothing that we did anything about. It was managed conservatively. And uh, I, I'll be very honest to say to you, we never re-X-rayed this baby. After 24 hours, this baby was breastfeeding. 
so we have questions. So participants have raised their hands. Okay, uh, go for it. Ask your questions. I think that's better. Hi, thank you. So yeah. it is fair to say that when we perform the M mode, the A line tend to disappear. Uh, no, the A lines are visible even when you do your M mode. So I'll take you back. Just give me a moment. So this is an M mode. So really, these are all A lines that are visible. There are no B lines at all. They look a little bit broken because of the way I'm holding my probe. It's a little bit oblique at this point when I'm doing the M mode. But in this section again, can you see how I can't see B lines? It's all A profile. So if I just take my, my, my laser pointer, problem is I can't play the image when I take my laser pointer. So these are A lines all the way down to the bottom. There are no B lines. A lines will always be present with a pneumothorax. You will never find B lines or comet tails. And there will be, so the four features of a pneumothorax are, we'll go back and I'll show that to you. So no plural sliding, and this is the lung point coming in here. So which is why I'm saying that it's not the whole of R1 that's involved. Actually, you can clearly see B lines with lung sliding and you have B lines coming in here. The reason they're not going all the way to the bottom is because I'm using a higher frequency. Uh, but what you've clearly got is uh, a lung point where plural is coming in and then you have no plural sliding with a complete A profile. So really, this is your lung point. But what you have to demonstrate in anomothorax is the absence of plural sliding, a pure A-line A profile, A prime profile is what it's called because there's no plural sliding with a lung point. And then in that area, you have to be able to demonstrate a barcode sign. These are the mandatory things that you have to do. And you must always, always, always look for the lung point. And the reason I say that is, if you quantify the lung point as I have at the moment, and this baby deteriorates, and I come back a little later, and I actually go to the posterior axillary line for a baby who's supine. So if you look at me, I scanned this region, this region, this region, and I had air up to the anterior axillary line, but now I've gone into the posterior axillary line and scanned. Well, this is getting worse. Any other Thank questions? You. So the, to quantify the pneumothorax, perhaps, as I understand, um, you will have to move up and down to, if you can, uh, determine how many parts of, or how long uh, the pleura is, has stopped sliding for. Is that correct? Both. So you're absolutely right. And the reason, so if you were using uh, a hockey stick and you put it here, it would only quantify two rib spaces and maybe two intercostal spaces. So that's R1. This is, sorry, this is the left side. I'm so sorry, R1. This is also R1 above the nipple line. So really you have a pneumothorax over here, but it could extend all the way down here. So you'd have to look at R1, R2. And then really what I'd be doing is moving across, probably doing another region in the middle, moving across and then basically doing R3, R4. And really, that is quantifying all those areas, putting M mode on all of them, basically trying to look for a lung point. And as I move laterally, and I find that actually now this air, which is anterior, has ceased because I can actually see lung that is moving because lung will collapse, but it will move. And at some point, what you'll see is an interface between heart and lung. And uh, that interface between heart and lung I will show you in the next talk on lung signs that we do. But really, that, that is the interface that is moving that you see, which is what we call the lung point, in that the sliding happening over here, no sliding happening over there. So what you see is an action like this. So that, that is how you quantify the pneumothorax. You can have small pockets of air. If it was a very, very small pneumothorax, then you might just have a small pocket of air here, nothing below, nothing below. So you actually have a lung point that finishes over here. But you, you must always see the, the, the lung point, which is the, the, the kind of transition point, because that is telling you that uh, there is 
a normal part of lung as well, maybe collapse, but coming into contact with the air pocket. Very clear. Thank you. Any yes. other questions? One last question before we move on to the next case. Yes, Alok. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you. So, yeah. If, if you if you are using um, the linear probe in a small baby, yeah. sometimes the difference between the upper and lower, how you quantify it? It's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I would only use the linear probe if I could because the linear probe will give you the entire area. And Leila, last case that I show you today will, will answer your question. So really the advantages of using a linear probe to quantify anomothorax versus a hockey stick in a baby. So, okay, uh, that's great. So we're gonna move on to the next case. Uh, so we'll do one more. So this is case two. So this was a baby who, whose mother went into spontaneous preterm labor. So what we're going to do is we're going to get Dr. Sharif and uh, Dr. Doris, you will be critique, critiquing these images. So let me see which side I offer first. Uh, I offer the right side first and then I offer the left side. So, so Dr. Sharif, you can talk to me about the right-sided images and then uh, Dr. Doris can talk to me about the left-sided images. So the history is as the baby is preterm 33 weeks, uh, the, the reason the baby delivered is because the mother went into spontaneous preterm labor. There is no known risk factors. She did have uh, a fall about, you know, 48 hours back and then started with some Braxton Hicks contractions and then went into quite precipitous labor and the baby delivered. There was a little bit of kind of bleeding, which was mainly postpartum, nothing antepartum. The baby was born, uh, had uh, mild RDS, so actually was managed with peep and delivery suite and actually recessed a little bit. Uh, currently, this baby is about three, four hours of age. He's on CPAP in about 30%. He's had a partial screen, started antibiotic. The gases basically from our perspective show a pH of 7.2 with a CO2 in the range of about 50. So the equivalent of about Again, 7.5 to 8 kilopascals. The lactate is 2.5. Uh, the baby is recessing, is working quite hard. So any questions? Baby's about 1,700 grams. Uh, no, I, I believe you covered everything. Uh, like the mom is not diabetic, not hypertensive. Uh, baby has... No steroids, uh, yep. preterm 33 weeks, yep. no risk factors for infection, and, and the baby's two hours of age uh, with a respiratory acidosis in the blood gas yep. and requiring FI2 of 30%. Yep. Um, yeah. Normal antenatal so, scans, you know, the, the anomaly scan at 20 weeks was fine. Yeah. Okay. So I, I have no questions at this point. Okay. So we'll go on to the next. So these are the images that I'm playing. So what you can assume is this is basically R1, R2, R3, and R4. Sorry, where is R4? So this is R1. Yeah. This is R2. Okay. This is R3. And this is R4. So okay. we can talk at this. Uh, I've got my cursor over. This is R1. Okay. So in R1, I can see um, uh, three, uh, sorry, two intercostal spaces, three ribs I could see. Um, uh, when I comment about the uh, um, pleura, uh, it looks um, thin, continuous, it's sliding. Um, I can't appreciate subpleural consolidation, maybe on the very left side of the, uh, no, the other, the other side. Yeah. Uh, there is areas that it could be subpleural consolidation, but it's not very obvious. No, less I than can't... five millimeters, you know. Yeah, less than five yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't say, I'd say it's uh, smooth and regular. Some uh, common tails I could see. Yeah. Um, and in, um, I can see A lines, uh, 
it's mainly A lines in both sides. Um, I, I can't appreciate three more than or three B lines in one intercostal space. So I, I um, the one on the left side. However, on the right side of the slide, the, no, the other side. Yeah, I could see um, uh, some B uh, lines, compact B lines there. Sure. So it's common A and B profile there. So Going AB to profile. Yeah. AB profile. Going to yeah. R two. Uh, so the pleura is. Uh, I I can't see too much sliding. To be honest, on the on this side, on the right side of the slide. Um, comparing to the way that the pleura sliding here, um, compared to R one, R two, I I can't see too much sliding. So, um, but at the same time, I can see some common B tails and B lines um, there and A lines as well. So it's common AB profile. Sure. So my question is, what would you do if you were worried that there is kind of A lines and no sliding? What would your next step be? Well, I would do M mode. Beautiful. So you're going to do uh, M mode over here. So for all yeah. practical purposes, we will we did M mode here, and you got a classical seashore sign over here, and you did M mode over here, and you got a classical seashore sign over here. Both. Okay, that's fine. I I would uh, make sure uh, like I, I'm con uh, I'm now confirmed that there is no pneumothorax because of that uh, sign. Um, so in both R1 and R2, there is. Uh, uh, com, um, mixed AB profile, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. But going to uh, R3, which is upper lateral, uh, I can see rural slide. I could see also um, it's uh, some, um, uh, I believe there is a long point. Well, I can see some uh, A lines on the right side of the uh, slide. Um, but on the left side, I can't appreciate A lines. So I, I got mainly B lines on the left side, but there is a A lines on the right side. Um, the pleura is uh, sliding here, and uh, I believe there is area of micro consolidation, yes, here on this side. Um, uh, okay, so are you, are you, do you mean double lung point as opposed to lung point? Because lung point would imply there's a pneumothorax, whereas you've kind of got B lines all the way through, even with the A lines. So with the A lines, I, I can see like a couple of A lines on the right side. Yes. Yeah. But I, I can see more B lines on the left, uh, on the other intercostal spaces. Like I yeah. can't see A lines on the other side. So it yeah. might be a lung point. So a lung point would imply a pneumothorax. Hmm. So are you, you worried about sliding over there? No, I'm not worried about uh, pneumothorax here. Um, okay. So I, the yeah. terminology that you should use is double lung point. Double lung opposed, point. Yeah, yeah. Because the risk is if you say lung point, the connotation lung point is used only when you do a pneumothorax. Yes. So double lung point. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. again, over here, I mean, do you think this is a double lung point? You know, you've got a kind of a a B profile. So the reason I say is when the baby inspires, you get this A profile that's dominant, but when the baby expires, it collapses. So this could be a double lung point, do you think? Uh, I I don't think this is a double lung point. No. Okay, fair, fair. That's fine. Okay, yeah. and what about R4? So R4, I can see um, the pleura is sliding, um, but however, on the right side, it's a bit irregular. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, with small micro consolidation, subpleural consolidations, common P B tails, yeah. B C. Um, um, I can see uh, also there is um, A lines uh, and B lines, so it's it's A B line profile. Yep, very good. So, and I mean for me, this looks like a classical DLP double lump point. Because you've got mm. a B profile with an A profile, but pleura, can you see the comet tails? They slide, it's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, the pleura being irregular is because I've lost contact over here. So as you can mm. see, you can see a nice rib over here, and then you yeah. see a little shadow over there. So it is, I mean, if you look at the pleura here, it's thin, it's visible, it's continuous. Again, the problem with the pleura as it's visualized, can you see when I get better alignment, the image moves to the now, 
the plural becomes thin and clear. And actually, yeah. some people think that's a shred sign. It's not. It's artifact because my probe is not aligned at 90. Uh, okay. So the plural basically looks as if it's falling away. It's actually intact on top. Yeah. So, you know, so my, my question to you is like 33 week, uh, kind of a sec pre precipitous kind of delivery with a mother who's been in short labor after a fall. Uh, wh wh what kind of diagnosis are you thinking of at this stage based on this, the right side of the lung? Um, I got the, like my preliminary diagnosis could be a TTN picture. Beautiful. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's fine. So now what we're going to do is we are going to get the lovely Doris to critique the left side. Okay. So looking at the left side, I take it that it's L1, L2, L3, L4. Yep. So this is L1. Um, yeah. This is L2. This is L3. Uh, sorry, not the one. That, that's L4. And I'm going to apologize in advance that for some reason, my images are not playing ball today, which is really disappointing. Okay, so I'm just starting the images. So that's L1. What okay. do you think? Okay, so starting with L1, um, I can appreciate the three ribs and the plural spaces and oh sorry okay. yeah excuse me sorry yeah okay and then starting with the plural so I can see the plural um so I'm moving on. Oh, okay I can see the plural um yep. it um most sure I'll describe it as continuous um because it's compared to the other side, it doesn't look as continuous. The right side doesn't look as continuous um, compared to the right side. Completely um, agree. Actually... Yeah. Sorry? I completely agree. Oh, okay. And uh, just I in terms, have... yeah. So what about, do you think there's subplural consolidations? Yes, I was coming to that. I can see, yeah, especially on the right side, yeah, those dots. So I think I would say there's subplural consolidation. But the plural is sliding. Um, and pro profile? The profile, um, coming to the profile, very few A lines, but mainly B lines. Yeah. Yeah, and so comet tails, but I can see B lines extending down all the way. Um, yeah. I don't know why there's, is, this, is there lots of contact because, uh, because of this space in between? Yeah, just over there, there's lots of contact. So. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Sharma, you know, this is a scan, probably one of my earliest scans when I was still learning. But I think even with this, I would agree that the plural looks really regular. The mm -hmm. subplural consolidations that are visible at this particular point. And classically, as a person early in my scanning place, I was unable to get any lung in L2. I can get the heart out of the way. But it was easier to go to L3. Now, L3 is relatively perpendicular, as you can see. Three ribs. So this is a really good area to comment on the plural. What do you think? Yeah, the, the plural uh, certainly not continuous, and I can appreciate lots of so plural consolidations. Yeah, and there is plural sliding, lots of B lines. Yeah, I think maybe very few A lines. So it's certainly a B um, profile, and I would say the, the B lines are compact. Yeah, so it's certainly a B profile. Um, okay. As L1 and L4. Yep. Um, L4, yep. The plural seems more regular, but I can still see lots of comet tails. Um, I don't know whether I'll describe that as some, some plural consolidation. Maybe I can yep. see some dots on the needle. Maybe those are comet tails. But there is plural sliding. Some B lines, but so, lots of, sorry, yeah. some A lines, but lots of B, B lines and comet tilt, but it's not as compact. The B lines are not as compact as L1 and L3. So a little bit better aerated in that yeah. region. So when the baby inspires, you can see the A kind of A lines line. coming. Yeah. But, you know, in terms of subtural consolidation, it's just over there. So if I just yeah. get my cursor up. Yeah, yeah, I can see that, yeah. Um, 
So just over there, you can see yeah. some, this is a comet tail, definitely that might be a subtotal consolidation. So what are you thinking about the diagnosis of the left side? Um, so on the left side, there are lots of B lines, the compact B lines, lots of them. So um, I think my first thought would be surfactant deficiency. Mm -hmm. RDS. Yeah. Okay, so RDS. Okay, yeah. now let's, let's let's open this up to the audience. So questions, please, because the right side you know, clearly from our perspective might have TTN as a problem, uh, but the left side has what more looks like RDS. So let's let's talk about this. This is the right side again. Anybody want to throw any? Um, yes, uh, Dr. Alok. So if we do the score of this ultrasound, uh, from the right side and left side, it should be not less than six. So more probably this is RDS more than TTN. Okay, I would I would be a little bit cautious about using lung ultrasound scores to make that differentiation. I so the the classical definition of RDS uh, versus TTN. So TTN classically does not have subtotal consolidations, and a combination of abnormal pleural sliding, which we can clearly see, it's very abnormal. It's not reduced over here. You put M-mode in all these areas, you'll get a seashore sign. Uh, clearly from our perspective at this particular point, there is evidence of subtotal consolidations on the left side. Now, what I would argue to you is that actually we all know that double lung points can present in babies who have RDS as well. And when you have CPAP, the right anterior areas of the lung tend to get better aerated as compared to the left lung. Uh, so what normal aeration and normal lung fluid clearance when you have transition, it's usually the right and the left anterior areas that get better aerated. So this could just be uh, RDS itself with a double lung point where you're having resolution and improvement on the right side, but the left side is still very bad, which is why the baby is struggling. So that, that is kind of the interpretation we made, but can you see the point I'm trying to make is the mental modeling is so crucial in this situation. Because clinically, when I look at this baby, he's got severe work of breathing on CPAP, his FiO2 is, is going up to 40%. So what did we do? So we did give this baby surfactant. But you can see the images here. We did Lisa on this baby. And actually, this baby clinically improved after Lisa. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, on the chest X-ray, this baby had moderate RDS. I'm not going to show you chest X-rays today. I want you to mentally model based on the lung ultrasound appearances. Any comments from anybody? Hello, sir. Yeah. So from my understanding that uh, double lung point is not exclusively for TTNB. Anything Absolutely. with intestinal fluid. Uh, irrespective of anything with interstitial fluid will present with double lung point. And Absolutely. here I feel more like RDS because the, uh, the subplural consolidations is not seen in TTNB. It is actually, if there is no subplural consolidations with uh, uh, the normal plural line we'll, and with double lung point, we'll go with TTNB. But there is subplural consolidation. The TTNB itself actually is a, one of the rule, rule out, we'll rule out that uh, feature is what I understand. And uh, it's looking more like RDS with, speech, with pictures of uh, DTMB because of the interstitial fluid. Okay. So this is a beautiful, is this Subhash? Yes, sir. So this is a beautiful example. Do you, un, do you see what mental modeling is? You're sharing your mental model of why you think that way. But what you're doing is you're describing the images and you're using the description of the images to come to a description which mentally models you to think about it in clinical context. And this is what yes. I want you, this is the next stage of how you should be reporting. So before I show you the last case, in fact, I'll keep the next two cases for next time because we, we want to have a little bit of your cases as well. But uh, yeah, we have three more very nice, beautiful cases. Uh, what I'd like to do is basically take you through Modeling before finishing uh, is take you basically through this concept. So when you've done your protocol, description is very important. And description wise, what I'd say is what you really need to be doing is 
describing what you can see in a standardized way. And as I've said to you, uh, some of you, when we showed you the first case, went immediately to query, is there a pneumothorax? And really, that's a step too far for me. Go back to, first of all, describing your right lung, your left lung, each region. And what you're looking at is the pleura, its integrity. Now, again, what I'd say is abnormal is a very vague term. So is it continuous? What is and how does it appear? Is there sliding? Uh, is, are there any breaks in the pleura? Uh, are there subplural consolidations? I mean, is there shred sign visible? Then after that, what you're really talking about is the deeper lung and its appearance, the kind of profiles that you have. But more importantly, each of these areas should, if you're doing this as your scan, have an M mode for them to either demonstrate usually what is the seashore sign. But if you're worried about a pneumothorax, then clearly from your perspective, what you'd be getting is the barcode sign. And then what you are describing is again, you know, you might get, uh, you say it's a B profile, but a B profile could be compact B lines, to severe AIS or white lung versus maybe just three kind of three to five lines per lung field, which is mild. So really I would then focus on a description of those areas and then whether you see subplural or you see deeper consolidations. Uh, and then a few other things like whether you see effusions because effusions are linked with both RDS as well as TTN. Mayank, you have a question. I have a question regarding the last case. Mm. So uh, the images that you show was actually a kind of heterogeneous picture for me. So I was a little confused if I should label it as RDS going by the clinical condition. If I clinic, uh, correlate clinical as well as ultrasound, so the baby is on FiO2 of 40%. And uh, usually uh, the babies who require suspect, and this baby is definitely more than 30% on more than 30%. So usually in such conditions, you would definitely get a uh, homogeneous disease and, uh, and uh, if we go by a, a lung ultrasound score of more than eight or so. Yeah. So this was actually not fitting into RDS, uh, not into TTN, but probably uh, is uh, was the baby on antibiotics also? Yeah, the baby was on antibiotics, but I don't have any shred sign and the baby CRP was one, one, one. Cultures were okay. negative. I have time because clearly from our perspective, what I'd say to you is you're looking at the scan at one point of time. Mm -hmm. I have actually done this scan before, after, and we've, we've basically done a serial images on this baby for 24 hours where mm -hmm. you can actually see improvement. So retrospectively, again, what I'd say to you is let's not get too fixated on the absolute certainty of a diagnosis at this point, mm -hmm. Because really, mm -hmm. clinical course in serial lung ultrasound would be a much better way of you being able to make that diagnosis. And that is why I would say that mental modeling wise, you have to make a choice here about what you're going to do. Really, if this is, and we know that TDN and RDS can overlap, that let's say there is an element of RDS over here. Well, this baby would still benefit from surfactant based on how he is clinically if we think there's surfactant deficiency. And I would also argue, just be very careful of labeling RDS as purely, it's homogeneous based on the fact that you have surfactant deficiency as the main pathogenesis. But we all know that surfactant deficiency can vary from reasons of the lung. And really what we also know is that supine babies, when you give them CPAP and PEEP, they recycle surfactant much better in the areas of lung that are actually well aerated. Whereas the collapsed and atelectatic areas tend to, if they're not recruited, develop worse highline membrane disease. So as a disease entity, the X-ray appearance that we've traditionally had is homogeneous, ground glass with air bronchograms. But actually, we've altered that natural history by giving this baby CPAP. And a good example that I'd give you is when you give surfactant, you classically get a whiteout to start off with. But later on, what you get is, if it's down the right side, you get differential appearance. But CPAP and the respiratory support you're giving is creating this heterogeneity because you've got well aerated areas of lung that are not so surfactant deficient as compared to other areas. Irrespective of how you might argue it, and I'm mental modeling it in my mind, giving this baby mm -hmm. surfactant is not unreasonable. You would agree? Mm -hmm. 
So is definitely, it... I would also have given surfactant any way because the baby is has crossed the, uh, that threshold. So, but uh, the uh, diagnosis uh, might. But I'm not so sure if uh, I'll be uh, okay with making the diagnosis on a RDS. RDS. Yeah, that's fair, and that's fair. And you know what I'd say is, it's I have the benefit of hindsight. We've given surfactant, babies improved. We've done serial scans. So you you could continue keeping an open mind and saying, look, it could be both. I'm going to treat with surfactant. I'll carry on scanning. And this could be a retrospective mm-hmm. diagnosis like HIE. Okay. You need more Thank information. You. you need more clinical profile. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? So last slide before we move on to your peer review is this. And this is the expectation that we have with regards to your reporting. So you're reporting all the regions, you're reporting all these things, and you use a standard terminology that you develop in your unit of how you want to use it. But for all practical purposes, what I'd say is plura being abnormal has a very wide connotation. I think you need to give a very nice description of what you think about the plura. But for sliding, I mean, we use a plus minus side. So the reason I'm showing you this is because we have a, where I work in, Southampton, we have a completely paperless system and we had to have logs like this in order to kind of fill in details. Otherwise, writing descriptions, you know, typing them in, it'll take days for us to fill the ultrasound reports in. But this is just one example of how you can report. Any questions about mental modeling, description, diagnosis, and clinical correlation? Does anybody have any doubts? Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir, uh, regarding the BRAF score method, like if we uh, that like uh, we know that if it is more than eight or nine to give for the surfactant, yeah, uh, is that a standardized like like standardized definition that uh, any like BRAF score more than eight to give surfactant? So what I'd say is that the BRAF score basically showed when they took the area under the curve that the sensitivity and specificity for need for surfactant based on how many babies got treated was optimally done when the score was above eight. But I would advise a little bit of caution. There's some authors who are now coming up and saying that we should actually use a score of 10 and above in a setting where RDS is... So a good example that I'd give you from our perspective is that you've got a, a 33-weeker, say, for example, who's more likely to have TTN. Now, the risk is if you keep a lower BRAT score for babies like that, you might end up giving surfactant to a lot of babies with TTN. On the other hand, if I, if I want to make that uh, more patient-specific or individualized treatment, if I've got a, a baby who's 33 weeks, who's basically got subplural consolidations, uh, along with uh, uh, an in, the baby being an infant of a diabetic mother with uncontrolled diabetes, well, that is, can you see how I'm clinically correlating? And actually, some people would argue that you use a BRAT score of eight in that baby. It should be lower. So there are arguments to individualize it. There are arguments to uh, use it in certain patient-specific populations. But roughly, I would say to you that scores in the range of eight to 10 are what are used as cutoffs to give surfactant in babies under 32 weeks of gestation. And it really depends on what you agree in your unit is your protocol. Uh, I know that in Nadia's unit, they, 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 they will do an early lung ultrasound at one hour of age. And if the breath score is above eight, they will give that baby surfactant. So I think what I'd say to you, it also depends on your patient population. We know a lot of babies who are very IUGR, who are stressed, some of them who might be septic, often will have you know, lung sparing effects that you see on chest x-ray. So they might actually have lower scores. But actually, a lot of these babies get quite sick and have surfactant inactivation later on. So I think there is still work that needs to be done to kind of take these patient groups specifically to try and tease them out so that we can individualize surfactant treatment. My own approach, I would say, is I would first like to establish, I think this is RDS in every baby, 22 to 32 weeks of gestation. And I think, uh, and I know that our protocol in Cornish obviously doesn't allow that at the moment because we're not using lung ultrasound. But doing the scan before two hours of age is very, very important because the risk is you're then missing the window because there are a lot of babies who will have very high scores who will not have hit an FIO2 based on European consensus guidelines to say that they should be treated with surfactant. Now, if you wait eight hours 
and that baby then hits 40, 45%. Surfactant is going to be less effective. It's more effective the earlier you give it. Uh, also, the highline membrane disease gets more established. So surfactant inactivation and its efficacy is reduced. So that is the benefit of giving it. Just, I will be forwarding to you, and some of you might have already read the European guidelines have been released with an update. And clearly what they allude to is that lung ultrasound is a modality that can be used for treatment term and quantification of need for surfactant in, in babies who are extremely preterm. Uh, last question, guys, because we want some peer review as well. Uh, that's it. Okay. Any any last question? So I'll stop share. And what we're going to do today is we'll peer review. What time is it, guys? Eight thirty-five. Okay. So we we've got about half an hour. So let's let's see how, how many cases we get through. So who's going to share first? I think it was funny. Dr. Funny, are you still there? I can't see Dr. Funny at the moment. She might. Hello. Yeah, yeah, she's there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. So, yeah. Would Sorry. you like to share? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll start sharing just a minute. Krishna. Just while funny sharing, any questions from anybody? Is my screen visible? It is visible. Yeah. Very nice. Thank if you, you just go into slideshow mode. Yeah, yeah, I'm just doing it. Yeah. Uh, so I'm audible and my screen is visible, right? That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, so I'm going to present uh, two cases today. And first one, uh, this is the ultrasound machine which we are using. The Philip, uh, we use a Philips uh, Epic 7C. And uh, I don't have a lung preset. So I'm using a vascular venous preset. Uh, I'll be commenting on the plural line, the lung sliding, A lines, B lines, and the pathology. Sure. This is baby A, a 33-weeker, 1.4 kg baby. I've done this scan on uh, day two of life. A, a brief history, baby is born of elective LACS because mother had a prolonged history of uh, uh, rupture of membranes for four weeks with leaking. And uh, uh, baby was uh, uh, growth restricted because mother also had severe anemia. Yep. Was a breed. So elective uh, LSES was done. Baby cried immediately after birth. Initially, first few hours was stable, uh, was on uh, room air, but started having worsening from 18 hours of life. Was started on CPAP 7 by 40. And then later within a short time, around six hours got intubated by 24 hours of life. Also had hemodynamic compromise in form of shock. Uh, so was started on, uh, was given fluid bolus and also started on inotropic support. Uh, at the time of scanning, baby was uh, on HFO with a map of 13, amplitude of 35, frequency of 10 and FAO2 of 40%. And uh, was on uh, a dopamine at uh, 10 mics per kg per minute. Otherwise, uh, hemodynamic uh, stability has achieved. Okay, let's have a look at your scans, yeah. yeah. So this is uh, R1. Very nice. Here, uh, the baby was on HFO mode of ventilation. Yeah. Uh, uh, so the uh, I have used a gain of uh, 63% with uh, depth of uh, four centimeters. I can see the subcutaneous uh, tissue and then ribs. And uh, I think I can see on the left hand side uh, uh, console, uh, it is looking like a dense B lines with uh, uh, pleura is, plural, pleura is uh, sharp, regular on the right side, but on the left side, it is um, seeming a bit irregular. Mm. And uh, on the left, uh, it is uh, a sliding. I think I could not comment on the sliding. But probably on the left, on the right hand side, there is no plural sliding. 
and uh, there is dense b profile on the uh, left half of the uh, screen and on so the right of the me, screen it is yeah for me dr funny i i think there is sliding on that right side and i know there's a lines but you do have these comet tails that are moving so do you want yeah. to highlight them so just go yeah the, you've got these comet yeah. tails so yeah. they are definitely moving so for me okay. it does appear that they're sliding on that side and i would agree that the the left side of your screen is a very dense b profile with yeah. you know a uh, tura that's a little bit irregular subtural consolidations i mean the question is whether you have one big consolidation there so anyway that's this is the right side is it r1 yeah this is r1 okay okay so that's fine where's your et tube just by the way what uh... Uh, I'll show the ET also. Okay, no uh, problem. Yeah. In the next, okay. sure, sure. In the sure. next, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, so this is uh, R one and R two, which are uh, captured in the same, uh, uh, like the probe yeah. is linear probe is a bigger one. So that's Going fine. To... Let's let's move to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, R three and R four. Very nice. Uh, yeah. I think. I'm not very sure this is a good image because uh, I don't see clear bat wings here. Yeah, it's a little bit fuzzy. Uh, I think uh, what you've basically got is uh, you're using a linear probe, and uh, yeah. the question from my perspective is, I'm just trying to work out the frequency. You know, it's in the uh, middle. Yeah, what what frequency we're we using? So actually, I I wanted to ask this doubt in my machine particularly. Uh, this is L twelve. It is the linear probe is L twelve three, yeah. and I'm not very sure how to change the frequency because uh, so, I've used this penetration gain in, मतलब uh, general and resolution, but it is showing some thirty eight hertz, yeah, yeah. one fifty three hertz, and so it's not coming in uh, megahertz. So I'm confused. Yeah. So my gut feeling is that's that's probably three point eight, which is why your image is is so fuzzy. It's not. as clear okay. as it should okay. be so there will definitely be uh, a kind of a a button to basically alter your frequency and really what you need to do is probably go to at least 10 and that will give you a much better image but roughly again uh, you can see plura uh, question is yeah. is there a little bit of a plural diffusion there you know just uh, there this yeah one. yeah i just wonder whether there's an yeah. diffusion there but visible plura Uh, at this particular point which mm -hmm. looks discrete with a kind of an a line that's visible underneath and then there's this area again that looks quite consolidated in the upper half yeah so yeah. and then you have liver below that mm -hmm. yep okay yeah. so yep carry on so coming to the next uh, slide next one this is uh, l1 l2 so yeah. i could not get the uh, lung it is uh, uh, i i could just get the heart and i was also a so bit you're getting the aorta you're getting the arch it's a beautiful yeah, arch yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> an interrupted arch no uh, coarctation yeah yeah okay so uh, i i had a doubt of pneumo mediastinum but i uh, didn't uh, know so pneumo mediastinum is not a diagnosis that we make on lung ultrasound Okay. okay i would right. just say that we we're, we're really talking about air in the pleura uh we oh. don't make a diagnosis of pneumomeristinum based on lung ultrasound uh at the moment so yeah basically there's no lung that i could see in that view but here i can yeah this is very good so this is what l what not very sure uh, what is the level Okay. So no, sorry. This is L one and L two, uh, like in the midline. This is just in the midline. I have uh, uh, just lateral to the sternum uh, in L one and L two. Sure. So here I am able to see the uh, E T. do you want to comment on this so it's tricky for me uh, because i would not normally look at the et uh, in this i would look at it with the aortic arch so okay. it's a little I bit tricky i think in the next okay i think in the next 
I mean, let's I just focus on the lung. What do you think about the lung? The lung is consolidated. Yeah. Um, like the blue, the line is thick. There is probably some shred sign here, and then uh, there are dense uh, cons. Uh, dense B lines. So it's a B profile. I wouldn't be able to comment on the shred sign. Is this a moving image? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Again, I'd be a little bit wary of saying that shred sign. That's more like a subclural consolidation, maybe a little bit of atelectasis where the, the lung has dropped back. For, okay. Okay. for shred sign, it should be really irregular. We'll be covering okay. pneumonia later on this week and okay. we'll show you the images. Right. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Right. Okay. And I think this is the one which I tried to see the, uh, like how much distant is it from the RPA? Yeah. So the basically, EP. you've got the arch coming through there. This is the descending aorta, and mm -hmm. my gut feeling is your ET is low because it's hitting the arch. So yeah. my 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 view would be that better than looking at it on lung ultrasound. It, it's using the linear probe, it's better to kind of look at it using okay. the cardiac probe. But yeah, oh. the first thing that comes to mind when I look, my question is whether your tube might be low. So yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank so you. We'll, yeah. So this is the uh, X-ray of the baby. Hmm. Okay. I mean, what you've clearly got is that right-sided kind of collapse. You know, the question from your perspective is, whether that's thymus or collapse, but you definitely have atelectasis of that right upper lobe. And then you've got yeah. quite significant consolidation of the right lower lobes. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think there might be pleural effusion also because uh, here yeah. the cost yeah. of the is... Yeah, and it's blended. kind of what we, yeah. we, we saw. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. What I'd say is, Dr. Funny, really important for your labeling to be right. Yeah. Uh, and I would probably agree with Dr. Zaredin. Uh, you know, once your ET has been pulled back a little bit, you, you could go up on the map. But yeah, that's, that's for me, when I critique your scans, a uh, few things that are very, very important. So just if you go back to slide five, please. Yeah. So if we could, that's where your ultrasound starts. And if we just go, so yeah. again, yeah. what I'd say is that really the frequency that you're using is compromising the quality of your images. You've got good depth. The good thing is you can see the tissue all the way down to the bottom. But mm -hmm. again, uh, my slight uh, kind of worry at this particular point is uh, it's just the labeling. Where exactly are we with R1 at this particular point? Uh, is this R1? And uh, just, uh, I mean, uh, I would, Probably say your focus is okay. So your focus is decent. So it, the gain settings are also appropriate. So mainly it's the frequency. It's working with the frequency yeah, to get yeah. your images. I'm not bit. able to find out the how to change frequency. I think. Did you get your technician I'll, to come I'll, in? Yeah. No, I think I'll call and I'll yeah. uh, get some help. Yeah. Yeah. No problems. Okay. Thank you. Thank My you. My pleasure. So the next person is Mayank. Mayank, do you want to go for it? Uh, I think I have one more scan. Uh, uh, Doctor, just, should we do it we next have... time? Funny, just so that we can get everybody sure, sure, sure. to present. That sure. would be really kind because we've got Dr. Hasoon yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Sure, thank you. I'll stop sharing. So, uh, is my screen visible? So I have put... Uh, the... Yeah, now it is, yeah. Okay, so I'll put it in slide mode. Yeah. yeah. So I'll start with the case. So this uh, baby was uh, referred to us on day two of life for respiratory distress. The baby was born at 40 plus three weeks of gestation. Birth weight was 3.5 kg and the baby was born through LSCS in view of uh, meconium stain lichen. So the diagnosis uh, that this baby had was vigorous uh, MSL, meconium aspiration syndrome, PPHN, had left pneumothorax as well and uh, underwent ICD insertion. Uh, baby also had shock, which was managed with inotropes. So um, the, currently the baby was uh, around 88 hours of life and uh, fairly on, um, on uh, minimal settings with uh, uh, P PIP of 16, PEEP of 6, FIO of 30%. And the baby was comfortable. The rates were 40 to 50 per minute. There were no retractions and there was an uh, left ICD tube in situ. 
Okay. Let's have a look at your images. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So uh, I couldn't image the left lateral uh, region because there was a dressing of the uh, uh, ICD. So first looking at the right lung. So these are the R1, R2 and uh, right lateral images. Uh, so uh, go going systematically, I can see uh, two uh, or mostly one rib space uh, clearly and a little bit of second one. Um, uh, there are some, uh, the pleura is uh, looking normal and sliding well. There uh, are multiple A lines and I can see a few lung rockets. So uh, in between, I can also appreciate uh, some B lines, which is erasing the A lines, but uh, the uh, overall profile, I would uh, like to label it as A profile. Uh, similarly, in R2, I will label it as A profile. The pleura is normal, sliding well. There, there are A lines, there are some lung rockets, um, but this is predominantly an A profile. Again, the same I would say for the right lateral part of the lung. So A if nice. I move to yep. the left lung, so uh, in so this was interesting. So in L1, the pleura is nicely seen. There are no comet tails, there's no B lines, and the pleura is not sliding. So this is a, uh, a prime profile or a, a dash profile. And when I came to the L2 region, I could see in the cranial part, I could appreciate uh, the pleura, which was not sliding mm. and a complete A prime profile. Uh, and there was a lung point and there, thereafter I could appreciate the sliding yeah. pleura yeah, very nice. along yeah. with yeah. Uh, the some lung rockets. Beautiful. This is probably yeah. the harsh shadow which is coming yeah. in this because I'm in L2 season. Yeah. So, uh, and when I put the M mode, I could appreciate in nice. L1 and yeah. D. Yeah. So I could appreciate the barcode sign. And why yeah. when I put the uh, 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 cursor uh, on M mode in the lower part, and uh, th there were other images as well. I took the uh, uh, those images as well. So I could appreciate a C so shine. Uh, in the uh, part where the pleura was moving. So very nice. Uh, yeah, so, it's beautiful. Uh, I also... having a look at your images, very good quality, very good depth. I can interpret tissue all the way down to the bottom. Uh, just uh, do you have sh which machine are you using? Uh, Sonosite Edge 2. Okay, do you have sharp mode on that? No, no, no. We do not have a focus point. We do not have a sharp. Uh, no, the mode. focus point you won't have because the machine, it's beautiful. It's it's organized in such a way that the it optimizes ultrasound waves coming back. That sometimes does reduce artifact. But uh, yeah, what it, they're good. They're good images. I wouldn't critique them because a lot of kind of machines don't have sharp mode. And that just improves the crispness and quality of your images. What kind okay. and how large do you think this pneumothorax is? Uh, because I could appreciate only on the uh, anterior part and uh, I got the lung point on the anterior region. So I uh, I was thinking of it to be a very small pneumothorax. Sure. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, but when I, uh, so this was my interpretation. So uh, uh, an x-ray was uh, already done 10 hours prior, but I didn't have a look at that x-ray. Uh, I was kind, I wanted to blind myself before uh, I did the ultrasound. So on uh, my interpretation on ultrasound was left-sided pneumothorax, while well aerated lung on the right side. Uh, but uh, the x-ray when I saw, uh, the, it was quite uh, uh, different from what I expected. So there were multiple infiltrates on both the sides and I could not appreciate any kind of pneumothorax. This uh, left ICD, which is in situ, but I could not appreciate any uh, pneumothorax uh, on the uh, left side. I, so, would, uh, I would disagree, actually. I just wonder, you know, if you look at that area there, uh, I can't get my cursor. Just come down to the heart border. Okay. Come down to the heart border. Just there. There. That that okay. area of lucency. That that to me looks like a small, uh, you know, margin of air, which is probably in the mediastinum. Then whether you have a little bit of an anterior air collection with it. Okay. Because it's a very small pneumothorax, what you can see. Mm -hmm. 
Now, what I'd say to you, this is a very, very good case uh, to talk about with meconium aspiration. So just remember mm-hmm. that with early meconium aspiration, what happens with the clinical course is that you have a lot of mixed features of consolidation, atelectasis, because you have meconium plugging. Once mm-hmm. you intubate and ventilate the baby and in the healing phase, mm-hmm. the, the young gets, you get a lot of air trapping, even in the areas that mm-hmm. you look at. And okay. the one thing that I would, I would genuinely comment on is that, you know, your sliding could have been better on the right side if you look at it. Okay. So, yeah, my, my, my gut feeling is what you're looking at at this particular point is you're looking at a dominant A profile. I mean, this bit here, R1, right in the middle, that's quite a giant B line. The question is whether that, that is really a yeah. consolidation that you see. Uh, but the rest of the profiles that you actually see, again, uh, I would say look reasonably okay, like an A profile and probably just rep- reflect air trapping. Uh, mm-hmm. But just with R1, I, this, the center, that central kind of B line and that profile that you see okay. there, I, I yeah. just wonder whether there's an element of consolidation there as opposed to this just being, you know, it's quite dense in the middle. Uh, mm-hmm. And again, if you went, and this is the challenge with the hockey stick, is that as you go lower down, you know, right to the mm. margin of your screen on R1. Mm. It looks very dense over there as well. And if you had a linear probe, do you have a linear probe, Mayank? Yeah. Can you, uh, what, what I would advise is, next time, take these images and take them with the linear probe and take the longitudinal view. And actually, that will give you a much better, what I call is a geogra- geographical view of the entire lung. I'm going to share two cases with you next time. Okay. To show so you I the differences. This- yeah. I did yeah. this examination with a linear probe and uh, I had kept a depth of around five centimeters. So uh, I also have now a query. So can we see if we have air trapping uh, like an uh, a meconium aspiration we have? So can we see such good aerated lungs, but the uh, X-ray picture would uh, probably look like this? It'll look like an A profile. But my experience, and it's not been described in the literature, is pool sliding is not so good when you're air trapped. And a very good example is when you're oscillated and air trapped. Mm -hmm. So sometimes Mm -hmm. it's to the point where you're worried, do you have an umutharax or not? Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd agree over here that especially R1, that that area Mm -hmm. in the middle, that is very suspicious. And again, just Mm -hmm. right side at the bottom, extreme screen, just it goes out. No, uh, higher up when you come to the plural line there, if you just go all the way to the bottom, so I think expiration, okay. the baby is basically collapsing down a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I would agree that R2 and the right lateral look absolutely fine. So it's well aerated mm-hmm. lung. You probably mm-hmm. have those areas of lung that are better aerated as compared to R1. And that reflects mm-hmm. in your x-ray. The interstitial appearance mm-hmm. is probably right upper lobe. Just L2, the question that people were asking was, is that collapse consolidation in L2? Is, That's is, hard. For this? Yeah. Okay, so it's, because I did the ultrasound, I know this yeah. is hard. Yeah, this is hot. So just so that people don't get confused. But beautiful images, absolutely beautiful. Oh. Yeah. And uh, That's it lovely. That's very kind. Uh, so yes, absolutely, Dr. Zaridin. That is the marker of improvement is that you, you should be able to see once an air leak is completely resolved, you might, if you've put a chest strain in and the lung is fibrosed in an area, see lung sliding that is diminished or that is less than you would see in other lung that is normal. But otherwise, clinically, my my perspective, I I would say that you should be able to see lung sliding. So we're going to get Dr. Hassoun to share his images. Thank you. Am I visible? Or You're audible? visible. Visible and audible, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. Dr. Hassoun, could you just introduce yourself to everybody? We'd be yes. so grateful. I'm uh, Mohammed Hassoun, a consultant neonatology, and I'm working now in Kuwait in Royal Bahrain Hospital in uh, Leverage Reunit. And uh, excuse me for the uh, for the for this uh, image, but this is my first uh, lung ultrasound. So first case is late preterm, 36 week. C-section delivery, GBS negative mother, good APGAR, no resuscitation needed, admission for persistent respiratory distress, 
IV perfusion and antibiotics started, and of course, sepsis workup is taken. And this baby is on BiPAP, FIO 2.35, 2.4, and with MAP 6 to 7. Chest X ray, I will start this one by chest X ray because this is my first ultrasound, and that and this chest X ray was done before we did the ultrasound. Sure. And it was at almost nine, six, between six and nine hours, and we needed to know what is this. This is pneumonia or or just TTN or RDS. So the set, when we did the X-ray, it was looked like pneumonia with this uh, hazy lungs uh, on the left and hazy lungs also on the right middle lobe. So at that time, at nine hour of life, the baby was on BiPAP FIO 2.35 with some tachypnea and minimum recession. Yep. With no improvement on BiPAP. So what so, age was the X-ray? What age was the X-ray? This one is four to six hours and ultrasound was by eight hours. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. So, you are welcome. Uh, I will start by L1, by order L1, L2. So uh, this is L1. Uh, this is um, a Siemens uh, ultrasound with linear probe, uh, 12 uh, Hertz and uh, with depth of 44 centimeter. So on, on, on R1, sorry, R1, we saw uh, plural line is plural, plural is sliding. Um, it looks regular, smooth, uh, mostly A profile. And we have some B line uh, in the lower part. This is R1. Yep. Uh, I don't know if we have the Dr. Alok, any comment, any criticizing, just do it because this is my ultra, first ultrasound. No. Just I needed your input also. Yeah, very nice images. Uh, you've got a beautiful machine, can I say? Uh, again, uh, it's shows a very nice crisp plura and uh, clearly what you can see is some comet tails with an A profile. You can then see uh, what is a B profile uh, in the kind of right side of the screen. Uh, classically, yes. what you'd describe as a double lung point. So your depth is up to four. Uh, I'm yeah. just, your, your frequency is about 13. This is a term baby, isn't it? Yes, term baby. So just to get depth, to get the whole depth, my advice to everybody here when you're doing your lung ultrasounds is you can take an image like this and then you can reduce your, your frequency to maybe about 10. And that basically ensures that you get better, better delineation of the lower half of the screen, which is kind of after three centimeters because you're missing out after three centimeters. The last centimeter or so is just a black dark area. And really the risk is you might miss a consolidation but I mean, the rest of the image is beautiful. You have mirror imaging of the ribs. Would you like to show everybody mirror imaging of the ribs? Now, obviously this is not a sign that is pathognomonic of a pneumothorax. And then my only question is whether you have a little effusion there, small amount of fluid. Here. So yeah, it's just that black, yeah, perfect. Uh, no, 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 just above, yeah. Uh -oh. Yes. There, yeah, that's you've got fluid there. So beautiful, very nice image. My only comment would be just reducing the frequency to get depth. Uh, the other option, obviously, from our perspective, is uh, you might and you can drop the focus down to a slightly deeper level to delineate those areas. So reduce frequency and just you can drop your focus to see the deeper areas okay. a little bit better. Thank you, thank you very much. No so for us, for me, this is R1 was double lung point. Very good. Yeah, I would agree. And this sliding there, you can see comet tails all the way. Some of you might think, well, you have mirror imaging of the ribs. Is that an omothorax? It's not because you see comet tails very nicely. If you have comet tails and comet tails are a good marker that the plura is sliding. So again, okay. something that, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Abhijit has uh, kind of spoken about in previous lectures. Yep. Let's have a look at your next image. Yeah. Okay. So this is al Artu. Uh, here also the plura is sliding and uh, smooth, uh, regular. There is comet tail sign and some B line uh, in the lower part with uh, so uh, also double lung point. Yeah, very good. So you yes. clearly, the baby's quite uh, upset. So you've lost contact in the initial half of the image, but then you get a beautiful image with the right half of the screen showing what I would say is a kind of an AIS white out, Coley's B lines kind of a pattern. Uh, the upper half of the image shows an A profile with B lines uh, and comet tails predominantly. So, yep, I would agree adult, another double lung point. Very good, yep. Yeah. So this is the uh, lateral uh, R3. 
also uh, normal uh, plural sliding uh, the plural is the regular smooth comet tail sign and it's in complete white out white out the uh, lungs at the uh, right side of the image no beautiful it's an absolutely beautiful image uh, dr hasun uh, can i ask yes. you for a favor yeah so if you would be happy and if you can consent the parents uh, uh, you know this would be a beautiful kind of a double lung point i don't think i have an image like this in my collection but uh, mm -hmm. yeah and if they're happy then you know if they're happy and you could lend it to me for teaching purposes i will acknowledge you but if they're mm -hmm. not obviously it was a pleasure like, it was a pleasure yeah. i will so, send you all can i just say i'm just, just uh, sorry. i'm just going to critique just this is the bat sign is beautiful uh i i don't think i can do a better image than this you've got complete uh, kind of uh, because this is a term baby the ribs are really nice and ossified you've got this dark area of kind of drop out behind the ribs and then you've got this pleura which is there right in the center now what i don't want you to get confused about this is for my colleagues uh, who are watching so some people sometimes label that area just below the pleura with the b profile as subdural consolidations they're not they're less than five millimeters this is seen in ttn so just above just below the pleura so if you go to the there there yeah that so those aren't subdural consolidations that's you know they're, they're they're kind of micro kind of consolidations which less than five this is my question this is yeah. uh, this is my question because i was confused because i saw this micro consolidation or sub pleura yeah. so i thought maybe it's rds more than ttn but how come no. double lung no. point no. with a uh, spared area and the sub pleural consolidation and this is what I want to say to everybody that when you're when you have TTN, the plura being regular, symmetrical, with sliding, can have an appearance of sometimes what we label as micro consolidations, but they're classically less than five millimeters. So okay. these these would not be labeled technically as significant subplural consolidations as you see in RDS. And really what they are is they're just reflecting the fact that you have well aerated lung. So when this baby inspires, they actually disappear. When the baby expires, they come back. Whereas with subplural consolidations, there's atelectasis and subplural consolidation throughout. So, you know, beautiful images. I have nothing else to say. Again, the depth, as you can see. So your focus just could move up a notch just to be at the plural line. And then if you want to see the deeper area of the lung, you can reduce your frequency and you can put the focus down a little bit so it'll be interesting like when you do the your next scan to kind of see how for me you you improve on the deeper sections of the images okay thank yeah. you thank you very much so we will move to the left side l1 also l1 uh, there is the normal sliding and the pleura is normal for me smooth some comet tails and uh, a grossly a profile yep very nice yep and uh, the l L2, 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 yes, the same issue, Yani. Plural is sliding, good sliding, smooth, regular, and the uh, comet tails with mainly a profile. Very good. So, yeah, uh, you have a little bit of lung pulse that's coming in there on that slide. Uh, but again, I can see comet tails, which would say to me that there is sliding there. It's not as good. And I think the reason the sliding is not as good is because you're mm. not as perpendicular. So if, if you compare your, your image on the left, where you're completely yeah. perpendicular and you can see the plural sliding. The plural sliding yeah. is not as well visible over here as uh, is seen because you're not exactly uh, perpendicular to the image. And that is this, also why your ribs appear crowded there. This is most difficult because left side with the heart, yeah. Yeah, I could do it like yeah, barely like this. Yeah. What I'd suggest is that a good way of doing that in that situation is it's moving literally and you you have to kind of angulate your probe so if you look at my chest you're kind of mm. doing l1 and really sometimes you have to use move medially and direct medially yeah. to get the heart out of the way but yeah. when you come to this portion this is where you get the most difficulty because the heart comes in yeah. and really you have to move laterally so you're kind of like you use the posterior axillary line for the posterior images in the supine position you might just have to use the anterior axillary line to have a look at the uh -huh. anterior part of the lung okay yeah okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you very much but yeah very so, nice uh, we will move now to okay i think the l3 this one 
yeah. in L3 also we have good uh, plural sliding and yeah. the smooth the regular and uh, of the upper part there is B line yeah. and lower part A line with some comet tail and this also micro uh, sub sub plural consolidation also was confusing me uh, so but it's yeah. a double lung point I think no? yeah it is a double lung point and they're very small they're very very small uh, again and this is where I would say that, look, if you are confused, the clinical course in serial lung ultrasounds will help. Okay. But they are now well described in the literature by Dr. Leo. And what he says is that they are usually less than five millimeters and that the profile still correlates with transient tachypnea, if that is the case. this baby, we didn't intubate. And yeah. we waited a few more hours. And after a few hours, baby uh, FiO2 was decreased to 0.21 and the pressure decreased to C4. And then the second day, baby was uh, on room air. Amazing. Well done, sir. My compliments. And your depth here again, just it's much better. Uh, clearly, when you have a B profile, because you have interstitial fluid, which is going to reflect sound waves much better than aerated lung, you get much better visibility, but what we lose out on is the aerated part of the lung. So again, what I'd say is just trying to drop frequency a bit, playing around with it, and just moving the level of your focus down would help optimize the image for depth. That, that's the answer to the question that uh, has been asked by, uh, by one of my colleagues. Thank you very so, much. My pleasure. Thank you. So, should should I go for the case too, or no, no time for so, it? So, because I would like Dr. Uh, Zaradin to present his case. We we okay. have we have three sessions this week. We'll have a lot of sessions. So please don't worry. Yeah, no please don't. Worry. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank That's you so much. kind of you. I'm so grateful, okay, Dr. Zaradin. You. Yeah, God bless you. Very nice. Uh, thank you very much. Interesting cases tonight. Yeah, very interesting cases. I mean, we learned so much from this. Yeah, please carry on. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my case is uh, basically a, a late preterm, 36 week uh, plus five days, almost term, uh, infant a diabetic mother with a birth weight of 4.650. Um, uh, presented with uh, initial signs of respiratory distress, he was put uh, on high flow nasal cannula at six liters per minute uh, with an FiO2 of about 28%. Uh, lung ultrasound actually was done on day three after the uh, signs of respiratory distress have almost uh, disappeared. And uh, it is done just after the high flow was discontinued. So this is. Um, our uh, one uh, picture. Uh, as a reminder, our machine is a sonosite with the preset um, lung uh, settings. So, uh, and I, I'm using the uh, hockey stick uh, probe. Yep. So, uh, as uh, I can tell, the, there's obviously the, given the size of the baby, uh, a classical IDM that I haven't really seen for a while. Uh, uh, in terms of presentation clinically, but um, you can see the, how thick the uh, subcutaneous uh, tissues are. Then uh, there is pleural sliding with uh, still um, borderline tachypnea at times, uh, given the breathing uh, rate, uh, and um, the there is a uh, some comet tails coming up. Uh, the plural line is almost uh, regular. There is a, a B uh, profile or B pattern, B line, sorry, on the uh, left side of the screen, while some, uh, while a, a, a profile on the left side, uh, on the right side of the screen. Yep. Uh, then moving on to uh, R2. Uh, R2 uh, has... Um, um, Again, the uh, regular plural line with comet uh, tail artifacts and lines and uh, predominantly an A profile with A lines could be seen. 
Um, the depth is um, obviously 4.5 centimeter. Uh, can I go back next to the... Uh... Yep, yep, looks like an A profile. That's very nice. And I mean, pleural sliding looks visible everywhere. Ribs are equidistant. Uh, the only thing I'd say about your previous image yeah. is the ribs a little bit crowded there. You know, those two ribs close together with a quite a dense area, you know, in the middle of that, that kind of looks more than just a compact beeline. Question is whether there's an element of consolidation, maybe atelectasis there. But yeah, it'll be interesting to kind of see what you think. Let's carry on. Yeah. Uh... Then I'm just going to move to the next. That's uh, R3. Very nice. Uh, yeah. Then um, you can see uh, skin subcutaneous uh, tissues and then rips, uh, acoustic uh, shadowing, pure line again with um, comet tails and uh, A profile. Yep. Uh, I would agree. So, you know, just a single B line that goes in the middle of the screen, but it looks like an A profile predominantly. Yep, less than three B lines per intercostal space. Good plural sliding throughout. And I mean, you're getting good, reasonable, you know, even with your preset settings, I can interpret the deeper area of the lung. My only question is do you know what frequency you're using for this baby? Um, I... It's uh, actually it's a preset uh, frequency. Um... Uh, I think my are, uh, my suggestion is on the sonar side there is a yeah. button mm -hmm. that you can press in your preset yeah. to change the frequency. Often it's yep, uh, and it's worth getting your tech in just to see if he can set it that way, set it up because you can change the frequency on the sonar side. And uh, the the advantage with that is your depth, your visibility will be much better. Yeah. The the beauty of the sonar site is you don't need to alter the focus because it basically takes pixels and optimizes them for every region. So just changing the frequency, maybe dropping it a little bit from where it is, will actually enable a little bit better kind of depth architecture interpretation. But yeah, the for me clinically and the image is beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, moving down to uh, R4. Um, uh, B uh, lines are coming into the picture with some A yep. lines. So yeah, uh, yeah, exhalation. Uh, uh, the baby, as I said, it's four point six kilos. But uh, with the help of uh, my nurse, we were able to uh, turn him around. Well done. Um, it was a struggle, but uh, it was. So this is the R five. Uh, you can see it's amazing how thick the uh, subcutaneous tissue is. Yeah, and yeah. it's a very nice image, sir. I'd say that the back regions in those big babies, you know, you're perpendicular, you've got equidistant ribs, the pleural line is good, it's visible, it's, you know, sharp and discreet. Obviously, the challenge here is you've got a lot of tissue through which lung ultrasound waves have to move. And my gut feeling is you've got a higher frequency, which means that, the superficial areas of the lung are visible, but the deeper areas, you know, a little bit of difficulty with visualizing them. There will be a, a triangle, and I can't see that there is a triangle which goes between penetration, depth, and uh, really helps with optimizing images. And it, it is something that you might want to just ask those guys to try and get up on your screen if you don't have it. Yeah. But uh, this, yeah, carry on, yeah. But it's a very nice image. Yeah. yeah. And this is um, our uh, six. Again, yep. uh, the posterior images, they don't seem to have much of a B profile on them. How uh, long after? Did you do them immediately or? Uh, actually, because obviously, given the size of the baby, what 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 I did, yeah, 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 yeah. I did the right and left anterior, and then we turned him around to do the uh, posterior together. Sure. Obviously. Sure. Uh, but it was, to be honest, it was all, uh, I mean, probably uh, minutes difference. It's not, a, yeah. I didn't wait for long. Yeah. Uh, we... Just going to move to the left quickly. Left yeah, side. yeah, sure, sure, sure. This is the L1. Very nice. Yeah, very Again, nice. Uh, plural sliding, uh, comet tails, good uh, pl plural uh, l uh, line, clear, I mean. And yep. there is a predominantly A profile. Yep. 
uh, L2, uh, pretty much a similar picture. Yeah, yeah. Because gain settings uh, could also go up just marginally, just playing with the gain a little bit. Yeah. Uh, it could go up marginally from where they are, but otherwise good. I can see tissue all the way down to L1 and L2 as well. Dominant A profiles, good plural sliding, very good perpendicular probe positioning. Very good. You know, for such a big baby, okay. uh, my compliments. I uh, just, you know, for the group to learn that you, you're really probably using, you know, sync colleague and sucrose very well. So my compliments. Yep. You just have to speak nicely to the nurses and you will get the... Uh... <laughs> so this is... Uh, Very L3. nice. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful uh, images. And then L4. And then the posterior picture. Uh, I think uh, this is baby was really kind of moving yep, a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Completely. And you've probably done the right side first. And then when you hit the left side, you know, it becomes more challenging. So, yeah, completely. And it's to say to all colleagues who are doing the, the back, just it has a lot of proprioceptors. So often it is very difficult. The baby tends to arch quite a bit. And, uh, you know, it is really challenging. But your L6 image again, it's, it's really decent. Again, here I'd probably say you have a, more of a, a B profile, L6. Yeah. So the Pura looks, but for me, I think you've got a lot of B lines there. And the only reason I'm there, I'm 100% sure that if you were able to change your frequency a little bit, you'd be able to see those B lines hit right to the bottom. Yeah. Will do. So Will they do. break the A lines. So, I mean, looks like a baby who's transitioning well, actually, clinically. Yeah. The only question that I have is whether you might have a little bit of consolidation uh, in that R1 image that we saw, but that's about it. And sometimes once you've removed a little bit of pressure, you can have these areas of collapse consolidation that you find. And I mean, they're just a reflection of the fact that the baby's just lost a little bit of beat. Yep. That looks like a really nice barcode sign. Yep. And then finally, this is his uh, chest X-ray on admission, by the way. Yeah. And that is him. Lovely. Chubby. Beautiful. Thank you. Very That's nice. Thing. So transitioning lung. Is there a yeah. barcode sign on the M mode? No, no, no. It's a seashore sign. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did I say barcode? I apologize if I did. No, no, no. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. No problem. It's a seashore sign. It's classical seashore sign. You can't see a barcode at all. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. I am grateful, everybody. Uh, I am going to stop there just because I think it's been a long session. But really, what we will be doing with the next session is showing you three more very interesting cases. And a lot of the focus this week is on the different types of pathology. So in the next session, we will be discussing air leaks. And in particular, some of the air leaks uh, will, will kind of involve term and preterm babies, but we'll be going back to lung ultrasound, air leak, quantification of pneumothorax, management, and a little bit about how you can use lung ultrasound when you're draining an air leak. So thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. And I, I'm grateful for your stamina. I, I, I apologize these sessions are long, but it's just to make sure that you really get good peer review. I think that's crucial for me. You know, it's, it's really important that you get back. So God bless you all. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.